The year is 2002. You're six years old, just a few months away from seven. Your dad puts a game into the PlayStation you've never seen before. You see a cartoon boy with spiky hair running around a tropical island. Your dad doesn't play for long before your older sister takes over. You spend much of your formative years watching her play this game. You play it too, but not as well. You want to get as good as she is. She beats up the gray-haired kid on the island. She can even beat him in a race. When she navigates the menu, she does it so fast you can't even see what she's doing. All you hear are the clicks and beeps. You wonder if you'll ever get that good. In 20 years, you'll introduce this game to a close friend. He'll pass the controller to you to handle the menus because they're clunky and too hard to understand. You navigate the menus not even reading them because you already know where the options are. You wonder if in this moment he feels the way you did watching your big sister play. You later confirm that he did. By the time you start to play this game for yourself, you've already cut your teeth on Pokemon and Tetris for your green Game Boy Color. You can read the menus now and know the gray-haired boy's name is Riku. You learn the brown-haired girl's name is Kairi. In time, you'll learn that her hair is actually auburn and you're just colorblind, but for now your sister just calls you stupid and says the names of colors that don't exist. You still don't really know what color auburn is. You spend more time in summers playing on the islands with your virtual friends than you do actually going outside. Eventually, you leave the islands. You watch as Riku gets swallowed by darkness and Kairi turns into, like, a, a ghost or something. It'll be a few years before you figure that one out. Eventually, you start exploring worlds from different movies that you've seen. Alice in Wonderland, Tarzan, Hercules. You start to realize some of the worlds that you visit are from movies that you haven't seen, and now you want to see them. You watch as the spiky cartoon boy Sora beats up Riku and gets his girlfriend back. It'll be a few years before you understand that there is more going on than just that. It'll be a few years before you ever even beat this game for yourself, in fact. You struggled to do most of it. You should have played on beginner, but you didn't want to look like a baby. Your sister could beat it on proud. You watch your sister beat the game, but neither of you stop playing. All of your formative childhood memories are inherently tied to this game. The first time you drank hot apple cider was when you were playing through the Tarzan world. To this day, when you see Deep Jungle, you can smell the apple cider. When you smell apple cider, you think of vines and hippos. You have trouble remembering things. Most of your childhood is a blur. The moments sit on the ground like a pile of photos that have fallen from the album. Anything more than a few years back is difficult to remember even. Sometimes you struggle to remember things that happened last week. Secretly, you hoped this would go away with age. You remember being in high school and thinking that it's normal not to remember your childhood, but you still remember stuff from middle school, so that's fine. You don't really remember high school now either. There's something deeply upsetting about this, that everything you are and everything you've seen is being washed away at a steady pace, that it seems like your capacity for memory spans only a few years and beyond that you're staring into the void. In that void is a game that you played more than any other, that you watched your sister play. You talk about it with your friends and online. You wrote and read fanfiction for it. It taught you what fanfiction was. It taught you that you love to write. You forgot this for a long time. This series is a beacon in the void. It's a waypoint that memories cling to. You remember playing Chain of Memories on your Game Boy Advance on a park bench while you were waiting for your sister to finish horseback riding. You probably would have forgotten she even did horseback riding if this memory didn't stick for some reason. Every time you hear Simple and Clean by Utada Hikaru, you want to weep. When Kingdom Hearts 3 came out, you played it and you felt a visceral sense of existential dread that didn't go away for months and you couldn't explain. You understand it now, though. It reminded you of all this. It reminded you of being a kid. You would have forgotten that you forgot that. Remembering it reminds you just how fleeting life is. It reminds you that one day, you won't wake up. In time, you'll come to terms with this dread. Somewhat, at least. You'll start to appreciate this series for what it meant to you. You start to realize just how important it is to you. Now, I realize that my experience with Kingdom Hearts is somewhat unique, but I think everyone can understand the emotional attachment that comes with playing the right game at the right time. While I doubt that anyone has this exact experience with Kingdom Hearts, I'm sure most of the people watching this video can understand the feeling. It's not exactly profound to say that video games can have an emotional impact on people. We like to think we can be objective and offer logic-based arguments for the value of things, but sometimes that isn't possible. Kingdom Hearts is a part of me. It's nestled into all of my childhood memories. It's reached through to the core of who I am. I can't objectively critique Kingdom Hearts any more than I could myself. I want you to like Kingdom Hearts. I want you to like me. But deeper than that, I want to like Kingdom Hearts. I want to like me. I can't just tear away the emotion and look at what's left because emotion is all that there is. Despite this, I'm sad here writing a retrospective on Kingdom Hearts. I'm not going to attempt to make an unbiased critique of Kingdom Hearts. It's a 20-year-old game, there have been enough critiques and reviews made of this game. 
Instead, I'm going to embrace my bias. It's sad to see how much hate this series gets and how it's so often ridiculed. It feels like Kingdom Hearts is the butt of every joke. I'm not trying to say I don't understand why I do. This series has always been weird, and in recent years they've taken it in weirder and more nonsensical directions. Making a giant mobile game that's plot-relevant and required reading for the next entry in your series isn't exactly a popular decision, after all. But while we're so caught up in making fun of the direction the series has gone, I feel as though we've lost sight of where it was. Kingdom Hearts is an important game. I'm not going to sit here and try and tell you that the entire series is a masterpiece and each entry is better than the last. It has flaws, and it has its ups and downs. Kingdom Hearts 1 for the PlayStation 2 is flawed itself, but that doesn't mean it doesn't matter. I hope through this video you'll come to understand Kingdom Hearts. To understand me just a little better. Before you even press start on New Game, Kingdom Hearts tells you what it is in full force. Know that I'm not being the least bit hyperbolic when I say this. The title screen for Kingdom Hearts 1 on the PlayStation 2 is perfect. I could write an entire essay on the beauty of this screen, but for your sake I'll hold myself to just a few paragraphs. The first thing we hear are the waves gently crashing against the shore. As the title fades in, we hear the beginning chords of Dearly Beloved, a song which I consider to be Yoko Shimomura's magnum opus, and no, I won't be taking questions. As we hear the somber yet hopeful notes play against the soft waves of the ocean, we're met by the full title screen. At the forefront is the logo, Kingdom Hearts. The font is aggressive. It has the energy of an angsty teen in the early 2000s. Looking at the font choice alone, disregarding even the words that each letter spelled, there's an edgy, angsty energy. This is often overlooked considering how the titles are used and so often placed among brighter elements, but this is an intentional choice that has meaning. This angry font is clearly juxtaposed against a heart. From this title image alone, we see two conflicting ideas. And right above it, we see the logos of Disney and Squaresoft. Disney and Japanese role-playing game developer Squaresoft. Two logos that have no right sitting in such close proximity. Again, we see the juxtaposition of two contrasting ideas, and beside it all we have an anime boy standing shoeless on a beach. Not an existing Final Fantasy character, not a well-known Disney character, a new design that's never been seen before. Except even in this design we can see the contrast of conflicting ideas. The design of Sora is the perfect meeting point between Final Fantasy and Disney. His hair is reminiscent of clouds, the anime art style and aesthetic, the infamous chains and belts of Tetsuya Nomura placed on top of a red jumpsuit with rounded shorts. Large, gloved hands. We don't see it in his title screen, but he even has the giant clown shoes typical in western cartoons, most notably on Mickey Mouse. The design itself looks just like the natural product of merging Cloud Strife and Mickey Mouse. As a child in 2002, I didn't notice any of this. I hardly heard even three notes of Dearly Beloved before I pressed New Game. Today, when I show people Kingdom Hearts, I don't let them make the same mistake I made. I have them sit and contend with this screen. I ask them to take in what the game is showing them. Even though you've yet to hit start, the game has already begun. Kingdom Hearts is an inherently absurd idea. The idea to make a JRPG where you visit Disney worlds and interact with a mix of Disney and Final Fantasy characters sounds more like a fever dream than an actual game pitch. And yet it was a game pitch. Squaresoft presented this outlandish idea to Disney, and they said yes. This title screen exists to prepare you for a game which is filled to the brim with completely conflicting ideas. The strangeness doesn't end at the pitch, Kingdom Hearts is built on the juxtaposition of opposed ideas and it follows through to the very natural end. If you go into Kingdom Hearts expecting a standard experience, you likely won't make it to the end. I know many people who enjoy the series for the gameplay but are disappointed with the story and design decisions. To that, I would say even this is intentional by the developers. Kingdom Hearts was made from two contrasting ideas and it can't exist without this. Like it or not, this is what Kingdom Hearts is, and it told us from the very moment it appeared on screen. Whether or not you noticed this or even wanted this is another story, but regardless, it told you all the same. Once you finally press start, you're met with what is perhaps the greatest opening sequence to exist in video games. While that might be hyperbolic today, I assure you that it was unmatched at the time. Were I bolder and unafraid of copyright strikes taking down this video, I would play the entire opening and song right now. In total, I would play it three times. Once at the beginning, a second time now, and a third right before the conclusion of this video. Analyzing the opening cinematic of Kingdom Hearts could be an entire video in and of itself. For fear of putting the cart before the horse, I'll refrain from analyzing the entire thing with full knowledge of the plot of the game. Upon your first viewing, this cinematic exists to introduce you to the characters in the beginning of the game. It shows you the island that you live on, and it shows you your friend who you'll come to know as Riku. It foreshadows the relationship that you'll have with him. He gets swallowed by the ocean, and in trying to save him, Sora gets pulled under. You see when he comes back up that his other friend Kairi is waiting for him. He runs to her, but their reunion is cut short as Sora looks back to see that he's falling once again. He's pulled beneath the waters to the location where you will begin the game. 
Though it's never stated in the game, you could assume the cinematic is something that Sora himself experiences. We come to learn that this tutorial that you go through is a dream that Sora had, and it stands to reason that as the cinematic ends in the same way this tutorial begins, for Sora this was one continuous dream. This doesn't really have anything to do with anything, but it's an interesting idea nonetheless. I suppose before moving forward I should warn of spoilers. I'll be spoiling all of Kingdom Hearts 1 in this video. Rest assured I'll refrain from spoiling any other games. With that said, I don't think that Kingdom Hearts is a game that's even capable of being spoiled. To spoil something is to give information which could retract from the experience. Not all details about a story are spoilers, only the ones that you wish you didn't know beforehand. It isn't a spoiler to tell you the name of a Game of Thrones character, but it would be to tell you if and when they die. I'm not really sure that there are things that happen in Kingdom Hearts that could retract from the experience, though. It's a very standard story that doesn't do anything particularly surprising or unexpected, and anything unexpected that happens feels less like a surprise and more like just another strange occurrence. I think even without playing the game, this video wouldn't harm your enjoyment of the game should you choose to play it at a later date. That said, my memories of Kingdom Hearts exist at the same time as my memories of existence in general, and so I understand I may not be the best person to tell you how obvious certain events are. To me, the events of Kingdom Hearts are as natural as anything. If you'd prefer to not be spoiled on the game, please feel free to leave the video now and return once you've completed the game. With that out of the way, let's dive into the tutorial. The tutorial for Kingdom Hearts is split into two parts, the first half being Dive to the Heart, and the second being Destiny Islands. In Dive to the Heart, you get your typical tutorial, how to move, how to attack, just generally teaching you what each button does. It's set in an empty black void where you stand on stained glass pillars depicting various Disney princesses while you listen to an eerie harmonic singing. Again, with the strange juxtaposition. Dark, eerie environment, bright and colorful Disney princesses. Weirdly, Cinderella is a brunette in her art here. I can't explain why. This genuinely baffles me to this day, and so I thought I'd mention it despite it being wholly irrelevant to the overall experience. The tutorial starts by asking you to pick between three items, a sword, a shield, and a magic staff. You choose one to keep and one to discard. This is how you influence your starting stats in the game. Sword is strength, shield for defense, and staff is magic. After choosing your weapon, the stained glass platform beneath you shatters and you fall to the aforementioned platform depicting the cursed art of Cinderella, where you now get your battle tutorial, Fighting Shadows. After you learn how to pick up and throw items, you go through a door to find three kids standing on a wooden platform that you'll find out is part of Destiny Islands. As a kid playing this, these just seemed like random kids to me, but many of you watching will likely recognize them. The girl is Selfie from Final Fantasy VIII, while the two boys are Titus and Waka from Final Fantasy X. You'd be forgiven for not immediately noticing this, however, because their designs have noticeable changes. Selfie looks about the same, albeit a bit younger, but Titus and Waka look different. They look to be designs inspired by Titus and Waka rather than actual depictions of them. I don't know why they were changed so much in design. I could speculate or spend a lot of time doing research to find an answer, but ultimately they're very minor characters who, in this entire series, only appear here in Destiny Islands. Selfie makes an appearance as a cameo in Kingdom Hearts 2, but Titus and Waka are only ever seen in the tutorial of this first game. When you speak to each of the Final Fantasy kids here, they ask you a question like, what are you afraid of? What's important to you? What do you want out of life? Interestingly, this isn't actually a meaningless choice and it changes the game a great deal. Depending on your answers, you'll change the speed at which Sora levels throughout the game. The game tells you that your adventure begins at dawn, then it means you'll level more quickly at the start and it'll slow down later on. If your adventure begins at dusk, it'll be the reverse with a slow start that ramps up later on. If your adventure begins at noon, it'll be a stable level progression through the entire game. This is an interesting idea that you don't see very often. On top of being able to alter your difficulty at the start of the game, you're given this chance to alter your leveling curve, which will change your experience playing the game quite a lot. In addition to this, the previous choice of weapons alters the order in which you get these abilities. Combining these two systems means players will have fairly unique experiences through the game based on these early, seemingly innocuous decisions. Where I will criticize the game is that this choice actually matters a lot more than a new player would have any way of knowing. The game doesn't ask you, do you want to level up fast at the beginning, fast at the end, or steady all the way through. The game asks you seemingly meaningless questions, which it then uses to derive an answer from, and it only communicates this to you in a vague fashion that would only make sense if you've played the game a lot or read a strategy guide. Hiding a choice like this can be interesting, but when it's done to alter such a vital game mechanic, I feel it can sometimes have an unintended effect of making the game a lot harder or easier at certain points without the player ever even realizing it. If you chose a slow start and fast later levels, then you'll struggle a lot in early on fights while still learning the mechanics, you might feel like you're doing a lot worse than you actually are. Because Kingdom Hearts is an action RPG, you can offset low levels with higher skill, but the inverse is equally true. Poor skill can be offset by higher levels. 
For children who are learning the game for the first time, accidentally starting off with a much slower leveling curve and fighting early bosses at a low level before you even unlock the ability to see enemy health bars can make the bosses feel like impenetrable walls that you're just too bad at video games to overcome. For some particularly sensitive children, this could cause you to develop a complex where you just feel like you're bad at all video games. You're just too dumb and have too slow of reflexes to be able to play any particular game well. That's just hypothetical though, it's not like that's actually happened to anyone. After you make your choice that you aren't aware that you're making, you end up back in the shadowy void where you fight even more shadows and eventually the tutorial boss. Your own shadow grows and turns into a giant shadowy monster who you now must defeat. Once it's vanquished, you wake up on the beach from the opening cinematic. This is Destiny Islands, and it's up there for one of my favorite opening gameplay sequences ever. As weird as it might sound, I compare it a bit to the Great Plateau from Breath of the Wild. Not in form, but in function, as both serve as microcosms of the overall experience. The Great Plateau in Breath of the Wild contains a little bit of everything that you'll find in the overall game. It falls just short of being considered a vertical slice due to the lack of a dungeon or boss as is found in the Divine Beasts, but that's not a criticism. A tutorial isn't meant to be a vertical slice, but by including a little bit of everything you'll experience in the game in the Great Plateau, Breath of the Wild teaches you how to play the game just by letting you play the game. There are, of course, other systems and new things to do outside of the Great Plateau, but by giving you a small taste of what the overall experience is, it prepares you to engage with the game and to know how to have fun. That's a concept that I think is often lost in tutorials. Tutorials exist for two reasons. First, the game needs to teach you what the buttons do. Your controller is how you interact with the world, so you'll need to learn it before you're able to actually interact. But the second and more important part is teaching you where the fun is. I think this is where a lot of games fail, because it's something that's actually sort of hard to do. If you think to all the tutorials that you hate, you probably hate them for this reason. I should clarify that there isn't necessarily a single way to have fun in a game. It's going to be a little bit different for everyone, but there are going to be more common ways to have fun. Also, I should clarify that fun doesn't always mean fun. Horror games or strategy games may not really bring someone joy in the moment, for example. By fun, I just mean engaging with the game in such a way that gives you a fulfilling experience, be that what it may. You probably don't have a huge smile on your face while you're sitting in the training mode of Guilty Gear trying to figure out a combo, but hopefully it's something that you found engaging. The feeling of self-improvement and knowing that you've learned something and gotten better. That's the fun. And just as the Great Plateau places the fun so clearly for the player to see, so too does Destiny Islands. There's a lot to do on Destiny Islands, actually. If all you want to do is progress the story and move forward in the game, you can do the tasks Kyrie gives you pretty quickly. Race Riku, do some more tasks, fight a boss, and bam, you're done. But there's more to it than just that. Destiny Islands begins with a cutscene. The characters and story are a huge part of what people enjoy about Kingdom Hearts, and Destiny Islands is filled with some of my favorite moments. We see the interactions between Kairi, Sora, and Riku. We're able to understand their relationships easily. Kairi gets a lot more characterization in this opening act than she gets in the entire rest of the series. We get hints that she has a deeper backstory that she had to unfold. We see the rivalry between Riku and Sora. Riku is the older, cool guy that the protagonist is jealous of. He's better at basically everything. He's stronger, faster, smarter, more mature. You can battle many of the characters on the island, but when you battle Riku, he keeps score. Just this little detail does so much to make the player themselves feel what Sora feels. I want to beat him. As a kid, I really cared about beating Riku. Despite how much I tried, though, he'd always win more, and each time he would remind me how many times I've lost and how rarely I've won. On the start of the second day on Destiny Island, you race Riku. You decide to have a wager on who wins, and Sora suggests that the winner becomes captain of their raft. Riku swiftly and mercilessly rebuts this, saying, If I win, I get to share a Paupu fruit with Kairi, an action in-universe which is akin to entering a romantic relationship. Sora, the child, says the winner is the captain. Riku says he's gonna steal your girl. He doesn't laugh. He doesn't blink. He means it. I'm not interested in getting into shipping wars. I've been in the Kingdom Hearts community long enough to know better than that. I'm not going to discuss or speculate the nature of the relationship between the three characters. Instead, I'll discuss from the perspective of six-year-old me. Kairi is my girlfriend. This gray-haired, muscle-head cool guy is going after her. I need to win this race. Of course I lost. I mean, I was six. It wasn't even close. Afterwards, Riku says he was joking about the Paupu fruit, and says that you'll name the raft Highwind. In a way, this makes you feel even more childish. Childish for thinking that he was serious. Riku is the mature one. He wouldn't have a race to decide who gets to date your friend. That's childish. It's childish for you to have thought that that was what was happening. It was childish of me. Again, the game reinforces this rivalry with Riku, but not just by showing how Sora feels about Riku, but by making you, the player, feel like he's looking down on you. That he thinks he's better than you. And that makes you want to beat him all the more. 
Beyond just the story elements of Destiny Islands, Kingdom Hearts uses this tutorial island to teach you how to engage with the game. Destiny Islands is a small level with only a couple of different zones. On the first day, you get access to half of the island while Kairi blocks the door to the other half. She gives you a list of things you need to gather and asks you to bring them to her. The game doesn't have a quest log. It doesn't have arrows telling you where to go. You need to talk to NPCs and get information from them, and then use your own memory, problem solving, and navigational skills to complete the task. This style of gameplay was the norm when Kingdom Hearts released in 2002. Quest logs and waypoint markers being ubiquitous in games is a relatively recent thing, but at the same time, the game still needed to prepare you for this style of gameplay. I'd wager most developers would want their games to be enjoyed by anyone, regardless of their experience with games. Not all games achieve this fact, but I think it's something that developers generally aspire towards. And so Kingdom Hearts must teach you how to pay attention, and how to think. Kairi's task is mundane. It isn't difficult at all. Get some logs, some rope, a sheet. Even this mundane task primes you to be ready for more complicated instructions, though. Kairi's task is the equivalent of the first jump in a platformer. It's obvious what to do, how to do it, and it's easy to achieve yet that first jump prepares you for the harder ones to come. While doing this task, you'll likely realize there's more to the island than just doing what Kairi says, though. You'll encounter the Final Fantasy kids from earlier and have the chance to fight them. You can fight Riku, too. This is completely optional, but you'll get a small reward for beating them, and it's a fun challenge. There are also a couple of treasure chests hidden around the island. These are completely optional, but reward you for exploring. Here the game teaches you to do more than just walk forwards. Forward progression in Kingdom Hearts is incredibly easy if you know where to go. There are even entire levels that are completely optional. If all you do is put your head down and move forward, you'll miss a lot of the game. On this island, Kingdom Hearts asks you to do things that you don't have to. Finishing your tasks causes the day to end. You get a little cutscene, one with Sora and his friends in another of Disney Castle. This is the first moment where we see proper Disney characters. Sure, during Dive to the Heart, there are the murals, but in this scene we actually see them moving and speaking as fully-fledged characters. This is also where we see the contrasting ideas so centrally. The opening act of Kingdom Hearts feels a lot like a typical JRPG. Upon ending the first day on Destiny Island, you're treated to a cutscene at sunset where the island trio, Sora, Riku, and Kairi, ruminate on life on the island and contemplate what lies beyond. It's clear that Riku's given this a lot of thought. Their plan for exploring other worlds is to build a raft and sail beyond their island and find out what's out there. When you first hear this plan, it sounds silly and childish. Even when I played this game for the first time as a kid, I understood there weren't different worlds if I just sailed off the beach. Looking into the sky and thinking about what's past there and planning to get on a raft to get there seemed more like kids playing pretend than an actual plan. But Riku speaks of it in a serious tone. He isn't playing around. He genuinely wants to find the other worlds and believes that they're out there. We'll come to understand later in the game that the idea of sailing into outer space in the Kingdom Hearts universe isn't actually that absurd. Hook's ship from Peter Pan is flying through empty space, as is Monstro the whale from Pinocchio. Kairi herself comes from another world, and though this is said to the player early on, it doesn't really sink in as significant until much later. As a child, this cutscene just felt like three friends hanging out on the beach at sunset. As an adult, it feels like a grave warning. We understand the tutorial dive to the heart happened within Sora's dream, and so if we view the opening cinematic simple and clean as an extension of that dream, it feels almost prophetic. You add this to the serious tone that Riku speaks in when speaking of the other worlds, and suddenly the talk of exploring other worlds doesn't sound so cheerful. This cutscene is melancholic. It feels like a calm before a storm. And immediately after this cutscene, we cut to an instrumental version of the Mickey Mouse March, the theme song from the 1955 show The Mickey Mouse Club. Though it may be more recognized by modern audiences, the song which is sung by soldiers marching through a war-torn Vietnam in the conclusion to Stanley Kubrick's 1987 film Full Metal Jacket. I can't say with certainty that the Mickey Mouse March being used to contrast the melancholic ruminations of Kingdom Hearts protagonists against the whimsy of Disney films is done as an intentional homage to Full Metal Jacket's haunting final moments. Whether this song was used to reference this scene or simply because it was the song most ubiquitous with Disney's iconic mascot and its use in Full Metal Jacket is merely coincidental isn't for me to say. What I can say with certainty is that the scene of Donald Duck walking up to 50 foot tall doors only to open a much smaller door that was hidden within the larger facade is the greatest piece of visual comedy that has ever existed within a Japanese role playing game. It is strange though. Even as a child playing through Kingdom Hearts, I recognized the scenes at Disney Castle introducing Donald and Goofy and their goals and motivations felt so out of place. They felt like they belonged in a different game altogether. This isn't a criticism of poor writing or storytelling. Structurally, this makes a lot of sense. Destiny Island is our introduction to Sora and his goals and motivations, but Donald and Goofy are also main characters who, though they've yet to meet Sora, will join him on his journeys to come. It's important that during this exposition we come to understand them all the same, 
While the title screen of Kingdom Hearts prepared us for the juxtaposition of Western cartoons against Japanese games, we don't truly feel this until we hear the Mickey Mouse March. I said in the opening of this video that my dad didn't play Kingdom Hearts for long. In truth, he never made it past Destiny Islands. If you were to ask him today why he stopped playing, he'd say he didn't know what to do. I don't believe that, though. My dad isn't a liar, but he isn't the best at articulating his thoughts, either. He's a software engineer that used to write code on paper. He played first edition D&D when it came out and is playing video games for as long as they've existed. He could have figured out how to do a simple fetch quest in the tutorial zone of an early 2000s video game. I think more accurate is to say that he lost motivation to figure it out. Kingdom Hearts didn't hook him. I think it's no coincidence that the moment he stopped playing is the same as the moment where the game so clearly wears on its sleeve exactly what it is. Understanding and enjoying the absurdity that is inherent in Kingdom Hearts is necessary to enjoy the game and the series. If this is off-pitting to you, you'll likely struggle to get into the series. For me, and I think it's many fans, the absurdity is part of the appeal, though. The transition between the JRPG that is Destiny Islands and the Disney cartoon humor and tone in Disney Castle is fun. People who came to Kingdom Hearts wanting a JRPG action game or people who came wanting a silly and light-hearted Disney game are going to be equally disappointed by Kingdom Hearts, because by being both, it ends up as neither. To enjoy Kingdom Hearts is to accept this duality. Day 2 on Destiny Islands plays out much the same as the first. It's here that the island fully opens up and the player is given the chance to explore to their heart's content. Their goal is the same again, though. Kairi asks for a few items that are scattered around the island, and the player has to get them and bring them back to her. Once this is done, the day ends once again with a sunset beach scene and another scene from Disney Castle. These scenes are quite different from the first days, though. Here we see Sora and Kairi sitting on the dock alone. The scene exists almost solely as foreshadowing. Kairi comments on how Riku has changed. She says at first that she was afraid, but she was reassured knowing that they'll be able to return to the islands. That once they set sail, it'll be great. In truth, Riku is yet to undergo his true transformation, and the trio won't be able to set sail from the island. It's only moments away from complete destruction. It'll be a long time before the three of them are reunited again. Those players, we don't know this for certain. The tone of the scene hints to us that things won't stay peaceful for long. The cut to the Disney castle scene is a lot smoother this time. The JRPG and the Disney are starting to come together, though they've yet to fully join. The scene starts on a much more serious note, and slowly throughout it becomes more whimsical and typical of a Disney cartoon. Kingdom Hearts isn't able to put Mickey Mouse standing right next to his anime boy right away. In this opening scene, and for the majority of the game, Mickey Mouse is neither seen nor even mentioned by name, only ever alluded to. Kingdom Hearts knows better than to suggest that these two elements could stand beside each other so easily. They had to earn that. This whole video I've been stressing the absurdity of placing Final Fantasy characters next to Disney characters. I find it hard to believe that the developers of the game weren't also extremely aware of how opposed these two properties are. There are similarities, don't get me wrong, and those similarities are why I feel Kingdom Hearts actually works. But all the same, it's still a very strange idea on paper. The opening act of Kingdom Hearts serves not only to introduce the game, the mechanics, the world, and the characters, but also to make the player comfortable with the idea of these two properties interacting. I said it myself. Even as a child who was unaware of what Final Fantasy was, I could feel the dissonance present in the transition from Destiny Islands to Disney Castle. At the end of the first day on Destiny Islands, they wanted you to feel it. At the end of the second day, they didn't. And for me at least, they pulled it off. By having such a hard transition that feels wrong and then deliberately making a softer transition, Kingdom Hearts manages to make the two feel much more cohesive than they actually are. The first cut is harsh and off-putting. The second is smoother and more natural. The scene between Sora and Kairi ends on a similar note to the beginning of the Disney Castle scene here. These two scenes still do place JRPG characters right against famous Disney characters, but it doesn't feel as wrong. No matter what Kingdom Hearts says or does, it is weird to have these characters standing next to each other. But by slowly bringing the two together, first in tone, then in narrative, by the time Sora meets Donald and Goofy, it feels fully natural to the player. Why wouldn't these characters be in the same world? Of course, at this point, the JRPG and the Disney elements are still feeling disjointed. While the transition is smoother, as the Disney castle scene continues, it becomes much more like a Disney cartoon, even ending with the iconic Goofy screen. The cut back to the islands feels strange as well. We see Sora in his room as it establishes a storm brewing on their island. The cutscene fades and we hear battle music start to play as shadow creatures swarm the island. The player is given control here, but unlike in Dive to the Heart, Sora's attacks are useless against the Heartless. He only has a wooden sword after all. Once the player realizes this, they'll eventually find Riku when a cutscene starts as they approach him. Sora asks where Kairi is, but Riku talks past him, saying how the door is opened and they can go to the outside world. We see a large black storm above Riku as he says he isn't afraid of the darkness, reaching his hand out to Sora just as he did in the opening cinematic. This time it isn't waves that consume him, but dark shadows that begin to wrap around him. 
Sora reaches out and the shadows overtake him too. The screen fades to black before a light appears. In Sora's hand is a weapon and we see the text Keyblade appear on the screen, as though an inaudible voice is telling us its name. This is the moment where Sora gains his iconic weapon. Riku is gone and the shadow monsters attack, but this time when the player fights back, they're able to deal damage. It's likely that the player will spend some time trying to defeat all the enemies, but they'll likely quickly realize they're endless and notice a door by the waterfall that wasn't there before. Thinking back to Riku's line on how the door is opened, the player will approach the door. Through the door is a small cave where we see seen drawing Sora and his friends made as children. Kairi is standing there and behind her is another strange door with no handles. This one opens on its own, throwing Kairi back. She disappears as she passes through Sora and he too is knocked away. Now outside the cave again, we see the storm has grown and is consuming the island. All that's left is a dark void and a single piece of sandy land that Sora stands on. Behind him is the giant shadow monster that was fought during the dive to the heart, but this time it isn't a dream. Though he succeeds in defeating the shadow monster, Sora isn't able to stop the storm itself, and soon he, like the rest of his island, is consumed by it. Once again, we transition from a sad moment in a JRPG to the cartoonish faces of Donald Duck and Goofy, though this time there aren't any jokes. They merely point to the sky and comment on a star that's gone out. Even at six, I knew that this was the world that I was once on, though I come short of connecting this with an earlier moment in Disney Castle where they established that Mickey Mouse is off looking into why the stars are going out. I come short of realizing that what had just happened to Sora and his friends was what was happening to many worlds in this universe. The camera pulls back as we see what is probably the best integration of Final Fantasy and Disney that could ever exist, and we get a title card that says, Traverse Town. If JRPGs and Disney cartoons are on opposite sides of a line graph, Traverse Town sits right in the middle. At first, it looks like a typical medieval town that you might expect in a JRPG. European architecture, stone and wooden buildings with cobblestone roads. But the closer you look, you'll start to notice the odd proportions of different buildings and structures. The lamppost that curves and has white gloved hands pointing instead of wooden signs or arrows. The mailbox has a tongue and a top hat. It almost looks like if Toontown was a medieval village. Traverse Town exists to connect Disney and Final Fantasy together. This is the first time we see Disney characters standing right next to Final Fantasy ones. Donald Duck's nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie from DuckTales run a shop right across the street from a shop run by Sid from Final Fantasy VII. After Donald and Goofy walk away, we see Pluto, Mickey Mouse's dog, lick Sora's face. This is the first moment we see Sora interact with a Disney character directly. As you explore Traverse Town, you'll continue to see more of the two properties. Sora fights Squall from Final Fantasy VIII, now called Leon for reasons that elude me. Alongside Luffy and Aerith from Final Fantasy VII, these characters provide a lot of lore and guidance for our protagonists. They teach us about the world. But there's also the Dalmatians from 101 Dalmatians that you can find, and even a full side quest to find all 101 Dalmatians and return them home. You can find Merlin from the Sword in the Stone, but also just Arthurian legend, alongside the fairy godmother from Cinderella. And of course, this is also the town where Sora meets Donald and Goofy for the first time. Just as the title screen for Kingdom Hearts so boldly wears on its sleeve exactly what it is, so too does Traverse Town. On Destiny Islands, the Disney and JRPG were distant and disconnected, but in Traverse Town, there's harmony. The two live and breathe together naturally. Just by the architecture and world design, you can see these two ideas perfectly in sync. Here we finally see Kingdom Hearts fully embrace what it is. Traverse Town is one of a few Kingdom Hearts original worlds, just as Destiny Islands was. You can understand Kingdom Hearts through its original worlds. On Destiny Islands, there was dissonance. In Traverse Town, there's harmony. In Hollow Bastion, a world yet to come, Kingdom Hearts fully embraces the weird and begins to create its own unique aesthetic, fully becoming something separate besides the two. Something of its own. The worlds unique to Kingdom Hearts that exist based on no other property are themselves a three-act story, the beginning, middle, and end, though we'll discuss Hollow Bastion when the time comes. For now, in Traverse Town, you're given freedom. You aren't exactly sure where to go or what to do, so you run around and explore. Eventually, you return to Sid at the start of the world and meet Leon. Again, that Squall from Final Fantasy VIII, but for simplicity, I'll use the name Kingdom Hearts gives him. He sees you have the Keyblade and challenges you to a fight. Regardless of if you as the player win or lose, Sora isn't able to beat him and just passes out. What follows is the first big lore dump. We see Leon and Yuffie talk to Sora as Aerith speaks with Donald and Goofy in the adjoining room. Both conversations explain the central conflict. Sora wields the Keyblade, a weapon that chooses a hero to fight darkness. The shadow monsters attack him because they know he has it, and they're after his heart. The creatures are called Heartless, and they're born of people whose hearts succumb to darkness. There are many worlds, but they're hidden from each other. Something about the Heartless coming means they're no longer hidden. There's a man named Ansem who studied the Heartless and wrote about his findings. 
but the pages are scattered across many worlds. We'll need to go find them. It's now that Sora realizes what's happened to his home. He doesn't know exactly what happened, but he knows it's gone, and so are his friends. Before he can even come to terms with this, though, heartless attack. Leon tells you to go for the leader, though unhelpfully doesn't tell you where exactly that is. After battling your way through Traverse Town, you eventually find yourself in the 3rd District at the same time as Donald and Goofy. The two Disney characters are knocked away by Heartless and land on Sora, noticing that he has the Keyblade. Mickey Mouse told them to find a key, and they realize this is it. There is still Heartless around though, and so the three join each other in battle before they can introduce themselves. After a wave of Heartless, the boss attacks. I suppose here is as good a time as any to discuss the combat in Kingdom Hearts. While the Final Fantasy series has dabbled in real-time combat through the Active Time Battle or ATB system, they hadn't yet made the jump into action games. In the ATB system, the player was on time pressure, but they still only had to navigate menus in combat instead of directly controlling the characters. Kingdom Hearts took the classic Final Fantasy menus and put them in a full action game. In Kingdom Hearts, there isn't an attack button. Instead, there's a select button. X or circle if you're in Japan. The player is responsible for controlling Sora's movements as is typical in action games. Running, jumping, dodging, but to actually interface with combat, the player needs to use the classic Final Fantasy menu, now placed conveniently in the bottom corner of the screen. For the beginning of Kingdom Hearts, X might as well be the attack button, as that's just about all you'll use it for. The only time you need to navigate the command menu is to select the bottom option, which is often the interact button. In Kingdom Hearts 2, this interact button was moved to triangle and was adopted in re-releases of Kingdom Hearts 1, so if this doesn't sound familiar to you, that might be why. In combat, you can mostly just get away with mashing X early on, and if you play on lower difficulties, you can get away with this for pretty much most of the game, though it's far from the optimal way to play. Once Donald and Goofy officially join you, they'll each give you a new skill. Goofy will teach the player to dodge roll, an ability you have to equip that allows you to press the square button to roll. Donald will teach Sora how to cast magic, specifically the spell Fire. As opposed to dodge rolling, which has its own button, magic is cast through the command menu. You'll need to select magic from the list and then fire to cast the fire spell. While this might seem unintuitive, and in some ways it is, this system has a lot of potential. I like to think of the different attacks in Kingdom Hearts a lot like you'd think of a combo in a fighting game. Street Fighter doesn't have a dedicated button for Hadouken. You need to input down, diagonal down, forward, then the punch button. That will result in the Hadouken. Like Ryu, Sora doesn't have a dedicated button to shoot fire. The only difference is the button combo the player needs to input. In Kingdom Hearts, it's down XX to shoot fire. After inputting any command, the command menu will reset to its neutral position, with attack being selected, letting you resume your regular attacks or begin a new combo. While it's easy to look at the command menu and say how am I supposed to read that menu and navigate it while in combat, the answer is actually pretty simple. You aren't. You're meant to study the menu, get to know it, its options, memorize the button presses needed to execute them. The game doesn't give you every option right from the start, it adds them slowly as the game goes on, giving you plenty of time to get comfortable with each new item as it's added. Kingdom Hearts' combat becomes fun when you know where each item is and you don't need to think about it. I don't even look at the command menu when in combat, or really ever. I know what buttons I need to press in order to get to where I want to go. This is true for every ability Sora gets. Each one is just a combination of directional inputs and X button presses. Some spells or items like cure or potions require you to select a target. This just changes the combo. If Sora needs to be healed, your combo is down X, down, 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 X, X. If Donald needs to be healed, your combo just changes to down X, down, 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 X, down, X. That sounds like a lot to remember, and sure it's a bit inconvenient to make a single action like healing require so many inputs, but I actually find the system to be really engaging. There's something satisfying about navigating the command menu while in the middle of combat. It feels almost like a natural evolution of Final Fantasy's ATB system, which was first introduced in 1991 with Final Fantasy IV. The idea of the ATB system was to add action and a sense of urgency to the fights. In classic turn-based games, there's no urgency. The game will wait indefinitely for you to make your decision and select your input, with the slight change of introducing an independent timer for each combatant so that they act when their timer fills rather than in a predetermined order. The player is forced to make quick decisions or the enemy will just continue to attack while they're sat thinking. Kingdom Hearts takes this a step further, or perhaps several steps further, by giving the player full control of the main character and asking them to navigate the battlefield, dodge attacks, and position Sora so that his attacks will land, all while navigating the same classic command menu. This is a weird combat system, and in my years of showing Kingdom Hearts to people, almost no one really gets it for the majority of their playtime. The idea of playing an action game that genuinely doesn't have an attack button and instead asks you to navigate a menu to attack while still playing an action game is wild. As I've said many times, Kingdom Hearts is weird. But this weirdness isn't inherently bad. While I have some qualms with the battle system in Kingdom Hearts 1, and I feel like Kingdom Hearts 2 manages to improve in nearly every way, this system is actually quite fun. What's especially interesting and unique to Kingdom Hearts 1 is the magic system. 
See, the spells you cast aren't free. Sora has a fairly small pool of MP, and it doesn't grow much throughout the game. What's interesting is how Sora's MP recharges. There's no passive MP regeneration. Aside from standing on a save point which heals you, we're using items to restore MP, of which you can only bring a small number into battle. The way MP recharges is by attacking. Each attack that lands on an enemy fills up a small yellow bar. Once that bar fills up, you're rewarded with 1 MP. Because of this, there's truly no way to have a magic-only build in Kingdom Hearts 1. If you want to cast magic, you have to attack in melee eventually. If you've used all your items and are low on health needing a heal, you'll be forced to approach the enemy and play aggressively. Inexperienced players will often complain about Donald not healing them, but the problem isn't that Donald isn't healing them, it's that they expected to be bailed out to begin with. You got your health that low, it's your job to bring it back up. On top of all this, there's an extensive list of abilities you gain as you level up, allowing you to customize how Sora fights. Beyond just the abilities or equipment, armor and accessories that alter stats, but also importantly, different keyblades, new weapons that you unlock which are often themed after a different Disney property or a specific character or theme. Not only are the stats different, they each have unique modifiers as well as different weapon lengths, resulting in each keyblade feeling unique. All of this together creates a combat system where the player has a lot of freedom in how they want to approach each obstacle, resulting in a very engaging experience. While Kingdom Hearts can feel a bit dated at times, this combat system holds up extremely well. Though I don't intend to discuss the combat system for most of this video, and I'll continue to gloss over fights and boss battles as they occur, know that I do that only for brevity's sake. This video is long enough as is, and if I were to discuss each boss battle with the level of detail I gave the title screen, it would take an entire week to watch. Kingdom Hearts has dedicated fans who only care about the game's combat, and those fans are here for a reason. It's genuinely that good. Together with Donald and Goofy, Sora manages to defeat the Heartless attacking Traverse Town. It's here that they finally speak. I think many people looking at the game would assume that Sora, Donald, and Goofy became instant friends, but that isn't the case. Donald and Goofy invite him to join them only because he has the Keyblade. They believe they need the Keyblade to find King Mickey. Did I mention Mickey is a king? He is. Mickey's a king here. Sora's hesitant to join them. He mentions wanting to find Riku and Kairi. Remember that Sora didn't choose to leave his island or his friends. He's only just realized what's happened. Donald tells him they'll be able to find his friends if he joins them. Goofy asks Donald if that's true, and the little duck says he doesn't even know if it is. He just wants to use Sora to find the king. Leon encourages Sora to join them, though, and Sora reluctantly agrees. Donald then tells Sora not to frown and that he has to smile if he's going to join them. He says, this boat runs on happy faces. There's two ways you could interpret this. First, you could understand that Donald Duck is most likely not trying to say that their ship is literally fueled by smiling. The only logical conclusion is to assume that he's telling Sora this is a way of getting him to bottle his feelings up, stop thinking about his friends because Sora spending so much time worrying about his friends and being sad isn't useful to Donald. And this line is a way of rejecting Sora's feelings and instead forcing him to do what's most convenient for Donald. But on the other hand, this is a Disney game. I mean, their boat might actually run on happy faces. There's a moment later in the game where Sora and Donald get into an argument while flying their ship, causing it to crash. It seems like they crashed because they were fighting over the ship's controls, but maybe they only crashed because they were both mad and the ship ran out of fuel from happy faces. And in Kingdom Hearts 3, when Sora, Donald, and Goofy go to the Monsters, Inc. world and Sully tells them they collected laughter for energy, Goofy says, our ship is powered by laughter too. So maybe when Donald tells Sora he isn't allowed to frown, it isn't said to force him to bottle up his negative emotions, but rather just his genuine requirement to be able to fly in their ship. Is any of this important? No, not at all. But conversations like this are what make Kingdom Hearts Kingdom Hearts. While I don't plan to spend the entire video discussing lore implications of the full meaning of each line of dialogue, I do want to give you a genuine feel for what Kingdom Hearts is. In my Dragon Quest V video, I tried to keep a focus on what my experience playing the game was. I wanted the video to impart on the viewer the feeling of playing Dragon Quest V. I want to do the same with Kingdom Hearts in this video, and an essential part of Kingdom Hearts is hearing a character say something, pausing the game, and having an utterly pointless conversation with yourself or whoever is in the room about what exactly that means. Part of the charm of the game is hearing Donald Duck say, Our boat runs on happy faces, and stopping to ask, Does it actually, though? From here, the real meat of the game begins. After meeting up with Donald and Goofy and seeing a cutscene of all the different Disney villains gathered together discussing evil plots, you board the gummy ship, something which I'm genuinely not going to discuss at all in this video, and you'll begin exploring different worlds based on different iconic Disney films. Typically, when doing story recaps, people will gloss over this part of the game, each Kingdom Hearts game has a similar structure where you start out in a Kingdom Hearts original world, explore a variety of Disney worlds, then end the game in a Kingdom Hearts original world. People will say that the events of each individual Disney world are unimportant. Those people are wrong. Those Disney worlds are the majority of the game, 
To say that going to Halloween Town and exploring Oogie Boogie's mansion with Jack Skellington isn't important because nothing plot relevant happens is the same as saying that the iconic episode of Neon Genesis Evangelion where Shinji and Asuka learn to dance as a form of team building is just a filler episode. Not only are you wrong, you're admitting that you don't understand how character building and establishing themes provide value to a story. If you've ever said that Disney World and Kingdom Hearts don't matter to the story, turn off this video, go play Kingdom Hearts again, then come back and leave a comment admitting you are wrong. Each world in Kingdom Hearts meaningfully contributes to the characters, the themes, and the greater story as a whole. With that said, each world can also be viewed somewhat as an independent episode of a TV show. Each one is largely self-contained, and while it may be building up to something greater, it still has its own story. And these stories are built on the backs of established Disney properties. The entirety of my thoughts and opinions on Kingdom Hearts could not possibly fit in a single video. Just as I chose not to discuss each individual boss fight, I won't be discussing each Disney World in detail. It's important to me that you understand that I do this not because they aren't valuable and important, but because I simply don't have the time in this video to do so. Each Disney World builds our understanding of the universe and the characters bit by bit. In this way, while they are separate and important, they each serve the same purpose. So rather than discussing each individually, I feel safe in discussing them all together. The Disney Worlds are split into two sections. In the first group, we have the worlds based on Alice in Wonderland, Hercules, and Tarzan. After completing these worlds, the player must go back to Traverse Town. They then unlock a second loop of worlds, these ones based on Aladdin, Pinocchio, The Nightmare Before Christmas, The Little Mermaid, and finally Peter Pan. Once these worlds are completed, you must return again to Traverse Town before you can go to Hollow Bastion, the penultimate world. Partway through Hollow Bastion, you actually have to return to Traverse Town once more before you're able to progress into the final world, making it a total of four mandatory visits to Traverse Town. On top of this, there's an extra optional world based on Winnie the Pooh that can only be accessed by visiting Traverse Town. There are hidden pages scattered around different worlds that are required to progress in the Hundred Acre Woods, and so the player may choose to go there between mandatory visits to continue progressing in the Hundred Acre Woods. Perhaps more critically, Traverse Town also exists as the only shop location in the entire game. Save for a single shop in Agrabah, which has a very limited selection of healing items and a couple of weapons which when first visited are outclassed by other weapons you've likely already obtained. Traverse Town has the only accessory shop, gummy shop, and synthesis location, and its item shop will at all times outclass the offerings in Agrabah. This means that while the player is required to visit Traverse Town four times, it's extremely likely that they will choose to visit it significantly more frequently. This is intentional, as part of the purpose of Traverse Town is to teach the player that they're supposed to revisit other worlds. The first two Disney worlds you get access to reinforce this thought as well. Kingdom Hearts has very light Metroidvania elements. Specifically, it has light platforming and a growing moveset that Sora gets access to. Through the course of the game, Sora will gain different movement options. The two key ones are High Jump and Glide, which both do exactly what they sound like. Glide is upgraded near the end of the game to Super Glide, which lets you glide for longer without losing as much height. On top of this, after meeting Donald and Goofy, you get access to Trinities, little colored rings on the ground that let you interact with them to get new chests or items. As you progress the game, you'll be able to interact with different colors of trinities. Rather than a full metroidvania where these movement options are plentiful and unlock whole new areas, in Kingdom Hearts they're just a minor supplementary feature that give you new items and rewards for returning the previous areas and exploring again. By forcing you to return to Traverse Town multiple times, the game communicates to you that this is a normal thing to do. Traverse Town is filled with chests and rewards that are inaccessible when you first arrive. Each time you return to Traverse Town, if you explore a bit, you'll find something you couldn't have gotten before. Similarly, Wonderland has many secrets and rewards hidden without. Most worlds give you a new Keyblade upon completing them, but Wonderland doesn't. It has one, it just doesn't give it to you. You'll need to go back and find it yourself. Wonderland rewards you for returning, but it also reinforces the idea of exploration. When you first arrive in Wonderland, the Queen asks you to find boxes of evidence. The Cheshire Cat tells you there are four. It's explicitly communicated to the player that they only need one to progress, but getting all four will give them a reward. One of the boxes is very close to the entrance of the room and easy to spot. There's nothing stopping you from grabbing this box, immediately going and giving it to the queen. If you go out of your way to get all four boxes, the Cheshire Cat will reward you with the Blizzard spell, which will be very useful against the boss of the world. If you don't get all four, you'll still get Blizzard, just only after you've beaten the boss. These boxes have another use, though. When you return the boxes to the queen, she says she'll only look into one of them, and adds her own box so that there are a total of five, then mixes them up and asks you to pick one at random. Her boxes contain either Donald, Goofy, or both, while the boxes you provide have Heartless. If you pick a box with Donald or Goofy, you have to fight the mini-boss without them. If you choose the box with the Heartless, the fight happens as normal. If you found all evidence, there's a 1 in 5 chance of getting the box with Donald and Goofy, and a 4 in 5 chance you get Heartless. If you only got a single box, these odds are reversed. 
There is, of course, a trick you can use to always find the right box, but unless you had the strategy guide or a kid told you at school, there's no way you'd know it. To six-year-old me, this was a random chance. By doing this, the game once again in one of its earliest levels begs you to explore. Together with Traverse Town, the first loop of Kingdom Hearts serves to prime the player for the overall experience of the game. The boss fights in each of the three Disney worlds are surprisingly difficult. The level design, particularly for Wonderland and Deep Jungle, is dense and confusing. Exploration and backtracking are both heavily rewarded, but beyond mechanically, these Disney worlds prepare the player for the story as well. We've already established the ways in which Destiny Islands and Traverse Town introduce the concepts of Kingdom Hearts' narrative to the player, but the Disney worlds establish the core theme of Kingdom Hearts. Friendship. When Sora, Donald, and Goofy first met, they aren't friends. Sora is hesitant to go with them. Donald is manipulative and selfish, while Goofy stands and watches. While on the surface it looks like Sora, Donald, and Goofy get along for most of the game with two standout exceptions, their friendship develops naturally and plainly in view of the player. In Wonderland, Donald and Goofy show up to the scene like two cops. They see an innocent woman on trial and choose to do nothing and let her hang in the name of following rules. Sora jumps out in front, with no regard for rules or order, and defends her. We see Donald and Goofy follow. The scene in Wonderland shows us a huge insight into each character and their relationships. Sora is good-natured and quick to action. When he sees people in need, he'll help them, regardless of consequences. Sora is the first to speak when they see Alice in trouble. Donald and Goofy tell him they can't interfere with what happens in other worlds, that it's against the rules. As soon as Sora steps forward, though, they follow. This isn't because they're friends, and it isn't because they agree with him. They follow him regardless of the rules, because he has the Keyblade. They need him, so where he goes, they go. Then we see in Olympus Coliseum, Phil brushes off Sora and company, saying the Coliseum is for heroes only. Donald bites back, saying they are heroes. Goofy agrees and says Sora is a real hero chosen by the Keyblade. That wording is important. He isn't a hero for his strength, his fighting prowess, his experience fighting heartless, or any attribute of his own. He's a hero because the Keyblade chose him. The Keyblade makes him a hero. Between Traverse Town, Wonderland, and Olympus Coliseum, we're made painfully aware that Donald and Goofy are only with Sora because of the Keyblade. They aren't following him, they're following the Keyblade. While Sora, Donald, and Goofy mostly get along, there's always tension between Sora and Donald. This comes to a head when they arrive at Deep Jungle. Donald doubts Mickey is there and says they should move on, but Sora wants to land. He thinks Riku and Kairi could be there. The two fight and the ship crashes. Sora falls out and is separated from Donald and Goofy now in the jungle alone. When Sora finds Tarzan, he asks if he's seen his friends. He's about to say Donald and Goofy, but he stops himself. He thinks for a moment. Are Donald and Goofy his friends? They've only ever been concerned with their own goals. They haven't once showed any care towards Sora, and they've ignored his feelings the whole time they've been together. Instead, he asks Tarzan if he's seen Riku and Kairi. They're his real friends. They're the ones he's looking for. We cut to Donald and Goofy. Goofy expresses his concern for Sora, but Donald doesn't care. He says they can find Mickey on their own. The three meet back up shortly after this and decide to continue traveling together. Like most of the Disney worlds, the remainder of Deep Jungle puts the Disney characters at the forefront, telling a story inspired by the original film. The conflict between Sora and Donald goes largely unmentioned until the end of the world where Tarzan contemplates the relationship between friendship and hearts, something that's not only a core theme of Kingdom Hearts 1, but the series as a whole. Sora and Donald apologize to each other, and it seems the conflict is resolved, for the time being at least. From here, the party returns to Traverse Town to meet with Leon. As I mentioned before, this allows the player the chance to re-explore Traverse Town with new tools at their disposal. Eventually, the player will find Leon. Up to this point, Sora, Donald, and Goofy have been wandering aimlessly. They want to find their friends, but they don't really know how. It's upon speaking to Leon in Traverse Town that their mission truly begins. At the end of Deep Jungle, a keyhole appeared which Sora locked using the Keyblade. Leon explains that every world has a keyhole like this, that those keyholes are how Heartless are destroying worlds. They crawl through the hole and into the heart of the world, sending it into darkness. Thinking back to Mickey's letter about stars going out and seeing the destruction of Destiny Islands, we understand this to be the cause. Now Sora, Donald, and Goofy are aligned in a mission. Where before they were each following their own selfish wants, these wants are now in sync. The event which caused them to leave their home shares the same cause. Heartless are destroying worlds, and the Keyblade can be used to seal these keyholes and protect the worlds. This unlocks the second ring of Disney worlds and presents the goal moving forward visit the different worlds, and save them from the Heartless. Up to this point, we've been seeing various Disney villains meeting and discussing evil plans, but now, with the second ring unlocked, we actually fight them. Along with protecting the worlds from the Heartless, we dismantle the League of Villains one by one. It's also in the second ring that we see Riku again. We see he's working with the villains. Throughout the game, Riku is being manipulated by Maleficent. 
His priority is gaining strength and saving Kairi, and Maleficent uses this to get him to do what she wants. He kidnaps Jasmine and Agrabah, and Pinocchio and Monstro. Monstro itself is where we see how much he's changed. He jokes around and acts aloof just the same as when we were on the island, but it feels different. Before it was lighthearted, now there's a coldness to it. When Sora asks about Kairi, he just brushes it off and runs away with Pinocchio, baiting Sora to follow him. We see a scene with Maleficent taunting Riku, telling him that Sora doesn't care about him now that he has the Keyblade. When Riku and Sora run into each other, he's much colder, echoing to Sora the fears that Maleficent massaged. Sora doesn't care about saving Kairi. He just wants to run around playing hero with the Keyblade. After finishing Monstro, we understand why Riku was so obsessed with Pinocchio. We see him standing over an unconscious Kairi and learn that she's lost her heart. Riku describes her as a lifeless puppet. He had hoped he could use Pinocchio, a puppet that's gained life, to save Kairi. Maleficent tells Riku that the only way to save her is to bring the seven princesses of heart together to open a door to great power. Power he can use to save her. This is where each plot line begins to come together. In Neverland, you see Riku truly using the power of darkness. You can see he's cast everything aside for the sake of gaining power. That power he wants to use to save Kairi. We don't get to confront Riku in Neverland, though. We see him there with Kairi, but he runs off before we can react. We give chase and this conflict comes to a head in perhaps the most iconic world in all of Kingdom Hearts, Hollow Bastion. Before we get to Hollow Bastion, I want to take a moment to address some valid criticism that can be thrown at Kingdom Hearts' way though, specifically criticism of the level design. New players of Kingdom Hearts often complain that the levels are confusing and it's easy to get lost. You could criticize this as poor level design and a sign that the team that worked on it lacked experience designing levels for 3D games with platforming elements. I don't think that's fair though. I think Kingdom Hearts wants you to get lost. I say this because you don't always get lost in Kingdom Hearts. Destiny Islands was easy to navigate. Traverse Town has some weird geometry, but the rooms are conveniently named and it's easy to get a good idea of where you are once you've seen each room once or twice. The streets of Agrabah are laid out fairly plainly, and it's only once you start exploring the rooftops or go into the Cave of Wonders that the level starts to get confusing. Hook's ship is only difficult to navigate due to its small size. If you look at the levels that are most often described as being particularly difficult to navigate, that being Wonderland, Deep Jungle, and Monstro, you can understand that they might be confusing and difficult to navigate on purpose. Wonderland has weird level geometry, and although it only has two main rooms, the confusion comes from how they connect. Depending on where you enter the bazaar room from, it may be turned on its side or upside down. In both the bazaar room and the forest, you can become either big or small, which lets you interact with the level geometry itself when you're large, and when you return small, the level will be slightly different. This is all perfectly thematic within the world of Alice in Wonderland. To explore a level based on Alice in Wonderland that has normal level design and is easy to navigate would feel thematically wrong. Part of being in Wonderland means you're confused and lost. Deep Jungle doesn't mess with the level geometry to the same degree. It's a fairly straightforward level. The level is just very interconnected and asks you to run back and forth between different points consistently. It can feel like you're running around in circles, which, considering you're in a literal jungle, feels appropriate. As for Monstro, just like Alice in Wonderland, Pinocchio is a very surreal film at times, and so it feels somewhat right to be confused and lost. Not to mention you're literally exploring the bowels of a whale. What makes it so confusing is the interlocking chambers, which all look identical and feel organic. When running around inside of a whale, it feels strange to know exactly where you're meant to go and where exactly you are. On the whole, much of the confusion of each level is intentional so as to put the player in the same mindset as Sora. Sora is a young boy who's just left home. He's completely lost, both physically and metaphorically. When you spend much of Kingdom Hearts confused and unsure where to go, you begin to enter the same headspace that Sora is in. I haven't replayed Kingdom Hearts many times in my life. In truth, the only full playthrough I've done was as a child. I have, however, sat beside many people and watched them play Kingdom Hearts for the first time. Doing this has allowed me to see how different people with varying degrees of video game knowledge and experience wrestle with Kingdom Hearts mechanics. Most struggle with the combat early on, but eventually adjust. Many never get used to the strange menus and esoteric steps required to simply equip items. Almost everyone despises Deep Jungle. While I say that the sense of confusion that most players experience while navigating the various levels in Kingdom Hearts is intended and adds to the overall experience, I have to take a step back and recognize the pattern. Deep Jungle is an incredibly frustrating experience for new players. This is likely due to the unfortunate mix of poor early 2000s 3D platforming mechanics with confusing level design that makes it difficult for you to know where you are and where your destination is, and on top of that, objectives that require you to run back and forth between a small number of areas multiple times. This frustration is felt most in the section of the level that connects the camp to the treehouse, where the player must either climb up on trees and hop between vines or jump across the vacs of hippos in the water below. Perhaps this is because this section is the part of the game that most relies on engaging with the platforming. It's strange, I know that Kingdom Hearts has bad platforming, 
I've seen many people play this game and all struggle with this section and with the platforming in general. People who love platformers struggle with this, yet the platforming feels natural to me, despite the fact that I generally dislike platformers. I mean, I'm bad at them. I don't even want to admit how long it took me to beat Green Hell Zone when I played Sonic Mania for the first time. But jumping across the hippos in Deep Jungle? No problem. It brings to memory when I bought a new car recently. Not a new car, I'm not made of money, but a used car that's from this century at least. Honestly, every car I've ever owned prior to this one was from the last millennia. My previous car was a 1993 dark green Toyota Camry. When test driving new cars, they all felt weird and awkward to me. When I stepped on the gas, the car moved forward. When I stepped on the brake, they stopped. The car would react each time I turned the wheel. That's not how cars are meant to be. That's not how my sweet 1993 dark green Toyota Camry was. She was a fickle beast. You'd never count on her to do what you said. If you wanted to brake, you needed to really press down and let her know it. The car wouldn't just speed up just because you asked her to. If you stepped on the gas, she'd really think about it before making her decision. I've spent my whole life driving cars older than myself, and it wasn't until I bought a newer car that I realized the impact of that. Cars aren't meant to be fickle. Cars were meant to be precise to do exactly what you ask of them each time in the same manner. Kingdom Hearts is my 1993 dark green Toyota Camry, and Sonic Mania is a brand new Ferrari. Sitting behind that wheel, I wouldn't even know what to do with myself. Kingdom Hearts was the first platformer I played, and anyone who has played Kingdom Hearts and any other platformer should understand immediately and deeply the ramifications that this has had on my platforming prowess. I'm never reminded of this more than when I sit and watch someone new to Kingdom Hearts reach the hippos in deep jungle. Now they're forced to engage with the platforming where before it was a mild nuisance, and now it's the entire game. I've never seen someone play the section of the game without raising their voice. I'm not sure that it's possible. The reaction to this section that surprised me the most, however, was that of my mother's. Yes, my mom has played Kingdom Hearts. She did so recently in her 50s, and despite very limited gaming experience, did about as well as anyone else I've seen play Kingdom Hearts. What surprised me, though, was how much she hated Goofy. My mother, a children's pastor, would shout the most vile things at this cartoon dog every time he appeared on screen. She did this because she wasn't familiar with camera controls in games and he would block her view of the jump she was about to make. She didn't know how to readjust the camera, and so when he would appear on screen and obscure her view, she would scream at him while my sister and I cackled on the couch beside her. This was most notable during the aforementioned hippo hopping, where he would routinely stand behind her right on the hippo's backs, right in the center of the screen. My mother was never once frustrated with this section of the level. She never blamed the poor platforming mechanics or confusing level design. She placed the entire weight of this frustration on a fictional cartoon dog. It's tempting for me to turn this anecdote into a defense of the level design. To say that we shouldn't criticize the confusing level design in frequent backtracking, and instead to find the fun. That when we first played games, it didn't occur to us that the game could be bad. That there's a human behind everything that happens, and every experience you have in the game. When I was six playing Kingdom Hearts, I didn't even think to get angry with the dog that stood between Sora and the camera. If I didn't know where to go or what to do, it was a failure with me, not with the game. I needed to get better. It didn't occur to me that the game itself could get better. Honestly though, I don't tell this story in a defense of anything. I said at the beginning of this video that it's impossible for me to criticize Kingdom Hearts earnestly, and I'm sure by now you've seen this firsthand. While I sit here attempting to critique the level design and analyze the game itself, I find my mind wandering. Almost uncontrollably, my mind shifts back to when I first saw these woods and first jumped across the hippos. I think back to the smell of hot apple cider. In truth, I don't like hot apple cider, yet each time I'm offered it, I gratefully accept. It reminds me of Deep Jungle. More than that, it reminds me of my sister. While we sat playing Kingdom Hearts, she made it for herself and asked if I wanted any. I'd never had it before and was hesitant. I was a nervous kid and I didn't like trying new things. She convinced me to try it, and so I did. My sister and I both struggled with mental health issues in our youth. We each retreated into our own shells. We didn't spend a lot of time together. In truth, I don't have almost any memories of my older sister growing up. I don't remember us talking or playing together. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we did spend a lot of time together. Maybe we were close. If we were, those memories are long gone. All that I have left is sitting beside her, drinking hot apple cider for the first time, and jumping across the hippos in deep jungle. All I have are scattered memories that revolve around Kingdom Hearts. As I sit here writing this, I know that memories from this year are going to fade. In 10 years time, I doubt I'll be able to tell you anything about the year 2022. I hope I'm wrong, but I know that I'm not. I'll likely only remember sitting on the couch, cackling with my sister as my mom yells at a cartoon dog, 
while jumping across the hippos in Deep Jungle. With this in mind, it's impossible for me to look at Deep Jungle objectively. It's impossible for me to look at Kingdom Hearts objectively. This section began as an analysis of the level design of the various Disney worlds, and without me even realizing it, it's transformed into existential ramblings as I contemplate mortality. Just as the Kingdom Hearts exists as a contrast of Disney and Final Fantasy, my own thoughts on it are dissonant, a juxtaposition of logic and emotion. While I want to be able to provide a solid critique of certain mechanics, I find the words evade me. While this section was intended to address the valid criticisms thrown at Kingdom Hearts, please take it instead as an acknowledgement. Kingdom Hearts is flawed. The platforming is awkward, the menus are clunky, and the level design is confusing. It can often be confusing what your goal actually is. I know this. The weird thing is, I just don't care. Yeah, the platforming is awkward. Get used to it. Yeah, the menus are clunky. It was 2002. Sure, the level design is confusing. Not knowing where to go is part of the fun. It's so easy for me to dismiss each and every one of these flaws as though they don't even matter, and that's because the payoff is so strong. The payoff is Hollow Bastion. Never once have I heard someone say that they dislike Hollow Bastion. Honestly, I've never heard anyone say that there was a level in the entire franchise better than Hollow Bastion. Hollow Bastion is Kingdom Hearts. It still has the confusing level geometry and some awkward platforming. It has Disney and Final Fantasy characters running around together. It has the melodrama and the comedy pressed against each other. Honestly, I don't even want to talk about Hollow Bastion because Hollow Bastion is a level so good that it deserves an entire video to itself. To throw together praise for Hollow Bastion and stick it at the end of the longest video I've ever made is an insult. There will be people who will watch this video and never reach this point of the video. And that's a shame, because what they're missing is the greatest moments in the entire franchise of Kingdom Hearts. Honestly, some of the greatest moments in all of gaming. It begins with betrayal. When you arrive at Hollow Bastion, Riku is waiting for you. He acknowledges your rivalry, and for a moment Sora thinks he may not be fully lost. But just as in Highlander, there can only be one. You can't both be the hero of the Keyblade. Back on Destiny Islands at what felt like a lifetime ago, Sora and Riku had a race. Riku threatened to steal your girl. Today, he takes more. Riku reaches out his hand and the Keyblade goes to him. He doesn't steal it chose him. It was always meant to choose him. You were just keeping it warm for him. Riku throws you a toy sword and walks away. Donald and Goofy follow. See, that conflict between Sora and Donald wasn't just for show. At every step of the way, Donald and Goofy made it clear that they were only with you because you had the Keyblade. Now that Riku's taken it, they follow him. And now Sora is left alone, dejected, with just a wooden sword. Beast, as in Beauty and the, inspires Sora to push on. Beast came here on a mission to save Belle. Sora also came on a mission. For this first segment traveling through Hollow Bastion, the most elaborate, dense, and difficult world you've yet to face, you are powerless. The wooden sword you have barely damages enemies at all. In future re-releases, the sword doesn't actually deal any damage. You instead have to navigate the level and survive while Beast takes care of the enemies. It's now that we can feel the very thing that everyone has been saying to Sora throughout this game. The Keyblade is what made him special. It's what made him strong. Without it, he can't even defeat shadows, let alone any of the stronger heartless. We make it through this trial and find Riku with Donald and Goofy at his side. Just as Riku moves to strike Sora down though, Goofy steps in the way. Donald joins him. The king told them to follow the key and yet they stand at Sora's side. Throughout this game, Donald and Goofy were soldiers following orders. In Wonderland, they were prepared to sit by and watch an innocent woman be executed because they were told not to interfere with the world order. It was Sora that pushed them forward. But now, they make the choice themselves. Sora has changed them through their journeys together. This is the moment where Sora, Donald, and Goofy become true friends. Real partners. Yeah, the king said to follow the key. But they aren't going to sit by as their friend dies. Riku taunts Sora still. How will he fight without a weapon? If you've made it this far in the video, I'm sure you know how Sora responds. But do me a favor and pretend just for a second that you don't. This is a very common trope. You see it all the time in anime and superhero movies. This idea that the hero gets something taken from them, their magic, their special weapon, their power suit, whatever it is. Then they have to face a challenge and succeed, not through any tangible item or magic gift, but through their own merit. It's a moment that reaffirms, yes, they are the hero. We see the hero had the strength within them all along and didn't need any magic weapon or special power to win. They were strong on their own. 
Kingdom Hearts shows us this trope at the beginning of Hollow Bastion, but it completely subverts it. Sora isn't strong on his own. Remember fighting through the Heartless to get here? You couldn't. Beast did it for you. Sora does need his weapon. Or does he? In this moment, Sora declares defiantly, I don't need a weapon, my friends are my power. This moment is iconic and often joked about, but I think the reason it has staying power through all these years and what makes it so iconic is that it's a powerful message that's been perfectly delivered. Because he's right. We've seen it. We've seen how Donald and Goofy have taught him, given him new magic, new abilities, how he's learned from all the people on his journey, and how his love for Riku and Kairi has propelled him forward into the unknown. Even when his weapon was taken away, Sora still prevailed. Not through his own strength, but through beasts. Sora's strength is his ability to care for other people, to learn and grow from them, and to lean on them when he needs to. Kingdom Hearts tells us that we don't need to do everything alone. There's no shame in relying on those around you to move forward. Their help doesn't in any way diminish your accomplishments. People often joke how the whole Kingdom Hearts series led up to a fight in Kingdom Hearts 3 of 13 Xehanorts fighting against 7 Soras, but that's missing the whole point of the series, because it isn't 7 Soras. It's Sora and his friends. His friends who are sometimes clones and reflections of himself or who have at some point existed within him, but I'm not going to get into all of the strangeness and the metaphor surrounding hearts and existence within Kingdom Hearts. The point is that the battle between light and dark in the Kingdom Hearts series is really a battle between isolation and community. A fight between two ideas, relying on your strength alone, or relying on those around you to share the burden. Even in the very first game we see this as Riku is so determined to save Kairi on his own, that greed for power is what led him down this dark path. Sora opened his heart to others and let those around him push him forward towards his goals. When Sora says, my friends are my power, he's telling us that yes, he doesn't matter. Yes, he is weak. But he doesn't need to be strong alone. For lack of a better phrase, this moment is the heart of Kingdom Hearts. This is the defining moment where Kingdom Hearts tells us what the point of it all is. In many ways, I consider this to be the climax of the game. Sora's strength of character and love and appreciation for his friends wins over the Keyblade. It chooses him. And here, Sora and Riku fight. This fight is the war between those two ideas, relying on yourself or relying on others. This isn't the final moment of the game. After fighting Riku, you're not even halfway through Hollow Bastion. You still have multiple boss battles left, a return trip to Traverse Town, and an entire other world that within a completely separate final boss. While I like to imagine a world where this was the final boss and Kingdom Hearts ended cleanly with a battle between Sora and Riku, that isn't Kingdom Hearts. Sora and Riku's rivalry isn't the central conflict, it's just one of many. When Sora defeats Riku, it shows clearly that while Riku spent the entire game critical of Sora going and making friends, while Kairi was missing, it was that friendship that gave Sora the strength to save her. Sora won, but this only closes one book. After the first fight with Riku, you continue to explore Hollow Bastion before fighting him again. You fight and defeat Maleficent, putting an end to Disney's villainous council. When you fight Riku and beat him again, it feels like that should be the end, but there is one world left with the true villain waiting ahead. One final destination. The end of the world. The final world feels like the inside of a black hole. You see dark void all around and scattered bits of various world that it swallowed up. You fight through a gauntlet of enemies and bosses only to be met by the final boss, Ansem. Players that pay close attention would recognize his name. At the beginning of the game, we were told of a man named Ansem who researched the Heartless. All through the game, we find those secret reports of his which detail his findings and show his slow descent into darkness. And now we fight him, the mastermind behind everything. This fight happens on Destiny Islands. We see Sora's homeworld torn asunder and it adds emotional weight to this fight. For even the players who didn't pick up on the lore of who Ansem is and who feel like he's just some random guy that showed up at the last minute, placing this battle on Destiny Islands gets you invested. Whoever he is, he's the reason your home was destroyed. The end of Kingdom Hearts can feel very chaotic. It jumps between this focus on characters and their relationships and large, high-concept, world-ending disasters. Its story is both small and large. After jumping from the focus on Sora and his relationships to a giant world-ending calamity, it's just as happy to jump right back and end its story right where it started. Focused on Sora, his island, his friends. After beating Ansem, we see he's left open a door to the realm of darkness where Heartless come from. Leaving this open puts every world in danger, so we rush to close it. Riku's on the other side, though, but he can't leave. Riku has to stay on the other side. For some reason, this door has to be closed on both ends. You close the door, Riku stays in darkness. 
he doesn't get a happy ending. He's left there, in darkness, alone. You turn and see Kyrie. Defeating Ansem and closing the door has allowed you to restore the worlds that were once destroyed, including Destiny Islands. You see Kyrie on a patch of sand that's going back to Destiny Islands, but she's out of reach. Sora shouts out that he'll come back to her, and Simple and Clean by Utada Hikaru plays, as Kyrie floats away. We see Destiny Island reforming around her as the palm trees burst from the ground and the ocean comes to shore. We see stars shooting through the sky and know that the other worlds that were taken by the Heartless are reforming just the same. The ending lingers on Kyrie as she walks through Destiny Islands alone, and we don't see Sora again. He was left in the void that is the end of the world. When his island was destroyed and Sora was forced into the role of hero, he had only one thing on his mind. Find Riku and Kairi. Reunite with them. All he's ever wanted is to be with his friends. The end of Kingdom Hearts, Riku is trapped in the Kingdom Hearts equivalent of Hell. Kairi is back on their island, but Sora is left in an empty void, with Donald and Goofy. Sora had one clear goal from the beginning of the game. He just wanted to be with Riku and Kairi. He failed. He saved countless worlds, though. As credits roll, we see all the characters we've met on our journey reuniting with their loved ones, living happily in their worlds now safe from Heartless. Everyone gets a happy ending except Sora. Everyone gets what they want, except Sora. I was six years old when I played this game for the first time. Having heard what I've just said to anyone who would ask me dismissively, you like Kingdom Hearts? I have a question of my own. You don't? Ending the game with a clean and happy ending where Sora defeats Riku with the power of friendship and reunites with his friend sounds nice, but that just isn't Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts is a series with a protagonist designed off of Mickey Mouse who ends the game in an empty void alone, having sacrificed his own desires and happiness for the good of others. Kingdom Hearts isn't normal, and it shouldn't have a normal, clean ending. I like to joke that I've had my brain rewired by Kingdom Hearts. It's a weird franchise, and it's only getting weirder as the years go on. I mean, the trailer for Kingdom Hearts 4 shows Sora has an apartment in Tokyo and looks like he's part of Final Fantasy XV's boy band. It's hard for me to even keep track of the strangeness of it all. At this point, none of it really feels that weird to me anymore. I said at the start of this video that I wasn't here to make a review. This video felt messy and disorganized, that's because it was. I spent more time on this script than any other video, and it isn't even close. Not even due to just the length of it, I've spent hours sitting at my computer only getting a single paragraph out. This game is just hard for me to talk about. It's hard for me to organize my thoughts about it. Maybe I shouldn't make a giant Kingdom Hearts retrospective in that case. I used to make videos because I wanted to practice video editing and I thought it'd be fun, but that's changed recently. Ever since the Bakuman video, these are sort of therapeutic for me. I cried a lot while writing this script. This is probably the most deeply personal thing I'll ever post online. I make these videos because I have something I need to express and I don't really know how else to express it. While I did say I want you to like Kingdom Hearts, I understand if you don't. There's a lot to criticize, and while I don't agree with it all, I understand it. Everyone has a line of what level of absurdity they're willing to accept. Kingdom Hearts leaps past that line for many fans with each entry. For me though, Kingdom Hearts isn't even really about Sora, Keyblades, Heartless, Friendship, or any of that. For me, Kingdom Hearts is drinking hot apple cider with my sister. Kingdom Hearts is bonding with my sister, who I don't spend enough time with. Kingdom Hearts is picking up my other sister from her horseback riding lessons. It's me rediscovering my love for storytelling. It's my love for writing. Kingdom Hearts is a reminder of my mortality and how impermanent my thoughts are. It's a symbol of my childhood, and the knowledge that most of those memories are gone forever. Kingdom Hearts is me. It's probably easy for you to write that off as it just being the game that I played during a formative time that there's nothing special about this game itself, and any game I played during that time would have left the same impression. Maybe. I, I don't know. I'm sure a lot of you have stories about games that have touched you in the same way that Kingdom Hearts has touched me. To that I'd say, tell me about it. Genuinely, I'd love to hear it. It's good at times to separate our nostalgia from critique, but nostalgia isn't inherently bad. Acknowledging the nostalgia and the power it has over you can be profound, and I think embracing that should be normalized. If anyone says you like a game just because of nostalgia, don't fight them on it. Think about it. What unique experience playing the game did you have that changed you? Those are the stories I'd love to hear, and I hope in this video that's the story that I was able to tell. Either way, I appreciate you watching this video, especially those of you that heard me out to the end. I hope you had a good time. Thanks for watching. Thank you.